we'll have, we've been hearing a lot about the three projects, two now in service, one I'm just about to start construction, uh, presenting them as well. Now we finally have PRT as a real example. And I would like to present a broader view because I think it's, it helps our industry to, to recognize it. Um, what I really specialize in and have since uh, 1983, I formally started looking systematically at all completely automated transit systems using the term automated people movers. Uh, and I, and in particular, the Morgan, I'll, I'll talk to you about the Morgantown system in West Virginia, which has PRT functionality, if we can use that word, uh, and I'll explain what that means now. One of the things I do in life, in professional life anyway, is every year I count up how many of these APMs are operator, operating around the world. And then I also count up what is the value of all the current contracts underway. Uh, and I find it a useful, they're, they're, those are two simple numbers that are, give a nice overview of what's going on. So at the end of last year, it, it was up to 150. Given how long we've been at this industry, that's not a very impressive number, really. But it, it's a solid base, more than two systems that just started a couple months ago. Uh, and of, again, I, I look at the full automation as the defining characteristic. That's according to the ASCE, the American Society of Civil Engineers definition. Uh, around which standards have now been written. Uh, and I look at a little beyond that. I also count up as best as I can how many people they carry on an average day. So you can compare a simple system that only carries a thousand people a day to one that carries 300,000 a day. Uh, and the, the total number, it's, it's several million, seven billion, seven million a day. Uh, and the, the safety record has been very, very impressive. I also look at where, how they're being built, meaning by what kinds of institutions, which impacts what kind of financing, what kind of operating oversight there are to them. And I do, as you see here, it's 35 airports, meaning we've heard the, the, the air side on the secure side. 13 air front or land side going out from the terminal to facilities outside the airport. Uh, 29 are in leisure systems, which are zoos and casinos and uh, amusement parks of various sorts. 21 are institutional, which could be a shopping center or a hospital or a development district, development authority. 32 are metros, driverless metros, mass transit systems. And then 18 more are lo what I term local transit or district transit. They are mass transit, but they're not a full scale or mod moderate scale metro. They're a circulation system owned and run by a, uh, a, a transit agency. Now, in addition to those 150, and sometimes, the, you know, it's, it's hard. Sometimes systems are, are closed down for whatever reason. Uh, so it, it ta it's a little tricky sometimes uh, coming up with that fairly simple number. But just so far this year, or about to open, five additional systems. So if we count them, and like Sacramento Airport is not, as I understand that it, it's supposed to open, I believe this month, but you know, maybe it will slip. Uh, and you see the Dubai Green Line is supposed to open the 9th of this month, I believe it is. Uh, there's the, the uh, automated vehicle system uh, in La Rochelle that's now in service. There's a system at a, a campus in Riyadh, in Saudi Arabia and a, uh, a, a metro line in, in Korea. So about 155 in the total world, fully automated trans passenger carrying systems. Now, of those, I'll see, that I, I count five as PRT. Uh, what are the characteristics of PRT? 
offline stations, flawless switching, real-time scheduling of service that's non-stop. To me, that's the what I call, or Lee and Elliot, I got the term from them, PRT functionality. Look, not looking at whether it's a three-passenger vehicle or a six-passenger vehicle or a 12-passenger vehicle or something. If it has that capability, offline stations and direct non-stop service, it has PRT functionality. So the service is more, I often explain to people, it's, it's not an automated line, it's an automated taxi-like network. So the five that I count as PRT are Two by uh, to get there. One is at the, the, the Rotterdam Suburban Park. Uh, the other one is what we've heard quite a bit about um, Mazdar, uh, Heathrow Airport, and then the automated vehicle that's it's not the right picture, but it's close to the one in La Rochelle. You could argue that it doesn't have its exclusive right of way, uh, but it is on kind of a pedestrianized street. And you could also say that the Heathrow system and the together system are not, they're not the classic community where it's locked into a guideway. They're kind of roaming down this corridor, guided through it, not locked into it. So uh, they're, they're kind of a loose definition of, of PRT. It has its advantages and it, that, that those conditions have their disadvantages. So now let's the, the one that is really much more significant, has over 35 years of operating experience, has an almost flawless safety record, really a, a very, very impressive, impressive safety record. Opened around 1976, it was a long, painful birthing process. It's in West Virginia, at the University of, of West Virginia, which is in Morgantown, about an hour south of Pittsburgh. Uh, it has five stations, so it's bigger than the Mazdar system, it's bigger than Heathrow. Uh, it, it, it's still a fairly small system, but if the, rea if the real core of PRT technology is real-time scheduling of service, and if the complexity of that process increases with the square of the number of stations, five is a lot bigger than two or three. Uh, of course, when we get to 10 or 20 or 100, it will become even more complicated. Uh, but it, 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 let's see, Morgantown, it, it was within the context of the U.S. Department of Transportation program, which was only formed in 1969. It was very actively involved in a number of R&D, research and development efforts, and buses, all, all kinds of things. But one of the things they looked at is the, the fact that uh, the traditional American city where you have a real peak of density at the downtown was the result of rail transit. That's where all the, the rail lines connected. If you look at your older European cities like Paris and London, you have a whole network of metros and so there's not that intense peak, but Chicago is the classic example where all the lines come together in one small district and you have this deep. Well, as we evolve towards more and more auto travel, that land form, that urban form, is really no longer valid, and traffic travel patterns are much more scattered. Very less and less of it is downtown oriented. So, the investment in PRT, GRT technologies by the U.S. government was an attempt to respond to that new reality that it's you know, we have a lot of scattered tra travel making and traditional rail transit doesn't respond to that. So the, there was a, as, as a, a lot of work in dial a ride as it was called then, super buses trying to define the, 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 inf the ultimate bus system. Uh, and there were a lot of demonstration projects and the Morgantown system was the one that was the most, the largest, and the one that lasts. There was a, a transpo situation, a transpo exhibition where there were four systems built, demonstration systems at Dulles Airport, back when Dulles Airport was essentially a brand new place. Out of that, there is an extensive literature on this stuff that's all archived and available electronically with, through the U.S. government, but a, a, a surprisingly rich old, yes, but uh, extensive literature. 
so Morgantown, West Virginia, it was had a troubled birthing, as I said. It had a politically premature opening. It had cost overruns. It had all kinds of controversy. There, were, the phase one. Uh, was only three stations and the federal government in 1976 essentially said, whoa, wait, we're going to back out of this field that the, the government should underwrite the development of new technology and of course the, the media grabbed a hold of that. The university was very clever and said, oh, in our contract it says if this technology doesn't satisfy our needs, the U.S. government will pay to tear it down. And they said, well, if you don't expand it, it doesn't serve our needs. So they kind of forced the U.S. government to add the, 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 the fourth and fifth stations. So it is about five kilometers, five stations, about 70 vehicles that's kind of gone up and down. They are 20, formally by someone's definition, 24 <coughs> passenger vehicles with, I believe it's eight seats. Uh, these aren't current, but they aren't that old either. About 40 million vehicle kilometers of operation have been accumulated. 65 million passengers hand handled. Um, 1.8 me meter for a mile. Oh, I'm sorry for the a I'm sorry. 1.8 million passenger kilometers. No, not a single fatality. That it, the average daily traffic is about 15,000. On football weekends, they handle a lot more. No serious accidents, no vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle accidents. The, the, the staffing required for it has gone down over the years as, as, as they have learned to manage it better. So it, as of a, a two years ago, it was, um, what's the total? It was 58, I believe it was. And they're eager to share data. I mean, they're very open it, it, because it's a publicly procured system. Uh, and Boeing was the main contractor, and they're no longer, no longer in the business, unfortunately. So there's no worrying about sharing the proprietary stuff. Um, it carries about two, pass two million passengers a year. It's largely funded the O&M cost by passenger uh, su student semester fees, uh, and their O&M, their budget is about three million dollars a year. That works out to about a dollar and a half per passenger. They, it's getting pretty old. About ten years ago, they had to replace the old mainframe computers because they couldn't even get service on. Uh, or parts on them, so they migrated it to a PC platform. Boeing did re-enter the field for the, and to respect their old customer and, and did the work. And since then, they have, they've been upgrading with some Department of Energy funds. It had, they didn't really think through the winter operation of it, so they, when they first built it, it, it kind of retrofitted into the design a very inefficient guideway heating scheme and that has been improved. They are upgrading, the changing the computers on it now and currently Bombardier, would, out of their Pittsburgh operation, are developing a, a superior, a, an improved uh, propulsion and braking system. And uh, just in the context of it, Morgantown in the 2000 census became officially an urban area, meaning it had more than 50,000 population, which meant in terms of planning requirements it had to establish a, a metropolitan planning organization and develop a comprehensive plan. And what came out of that is that what had been previously seen by the townspeople, that this system was really for students and it really has nothing to do with them, that people appreciate now how important that is to the life of Morgantown, which although it's only 50,000 or maybe 50,000 today, its topography is quite hilly, so the congestion problems of it are quite severe. I mean, there aren't too many cities that small that have the congestion problems that they do. And some extensions are under study. How serious that is at this point is, remains to be seen. Here's Peter Muller here. This is one scheme that he developed for one way to expand it. Um, and what the future is, we don't know. So I personally think it is helpful to our industry to present this bigger picture 
because it means okay now we have two systems in operation but they're really quite small and you know the sober engineering world will say well let's wait a couple of years and ac accumulate a couple of years of operation experience and see what the numbers look like and let's see how those batteries hold up and what the, uh, the, the environmental waste issues with that are. Um, so I don't know if there are any questions we can leave that to the end and I'll introduce